States. And I did that for years, but then I got to the point where I wanted to focus less on politics and campaigns and more on policy solutions for our community. So I went back to school and I got my master's degree from the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. And now I'm running for, and then at, actually after leaving that, um, after getting my degree there, I started working for a nonprofit agency. And I've been working for them for almost three years now. And I work to try to improve our air quality here in San Antonio and to reduce our impact on climate change. Now I'm running for county commissioner. And the number one issue I'm running on is improving the health of our community. You know, um, the commissioners oversee the university health system. They appoint the board, they set the budget, and we have really good county hospitals, but we still have poor health in our community. And a big challenge to that is our economic inequality. Um, we know that uh, there are people in low-income zip codes who, the first time they ever see a doctor, it might be an ambulance ride to the emergency room. By the time they get there, they're very sick. That's the most expensive health care. And we're all paying for that through our county property taxes. So if we're going to pay for it, why don't we do it the smart way? Why don't we go into low-income zip codes and help people have more opportunities to meet their basic needs, do more aggressive preventative health care education, and help lift up our community, get our community healthier, and save on the tax burden at the county hospital at the same time? All right, Mario Bravo. Now on to Getha Rodriguez, the other uh, candidate running for precinct to commissioner's court. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having us here today, and uh, thank you for all the listeners that are out there. Um, I'm Keta Rodriguez, and I'm running for County Commissioner Precinct 2. I am born and raised here in San Antonio. Um, I was born in the in the poorest zip code in the city, actually. Um, I After graduation, I joined the United States Marine Corps and spent 20 years there. Um, I enlisted as a private, and after 10 years, I was selected for a commissioning program. I was able to obtain my degree in government and politics from the University of Maryland, and then went on to serve the next 10 years as an officer of Marines having, and retired after 20 um, years of service. Um, I've been serving in the last four years as the county veteran service officer leading that department um, and making transformative change within that department just using technology and innovative ideas. Um, I'm running really for one basic reason and that's to ensure that every single person in Bear County has the opportunity to achieve success, prosperity, and a great quality of life. And I know that sounds really broad um, but if you consider that to some people that means just having access to affordable housing, to some people it means just having a community that's safe where their kids can walk to school, um, having uh, uh, economic development in communities that are severely distressed, um, having access to affordable health care, all of those basic needs. And I'm running because I believe that we need to really – Take a step back and prioritize what we are doing. As we've been out walking and talking to people, um, knocking on doors and, and uh, going to community meetings, what we've learned is a lot of people don't know who their county commissioner is. A lot of people have no idea what the county does. And that's really, that's really something that's concerning. And what we're hearing is what we need is active and engaged leadership. At the end of the day, it's really about a mindset. It's about being a leader who is representative of the people. And that's what um, that's one of the reasons that I'm running. All right. Now let's go to questions. And the phone lines are open 210-614-8980. We have the two challengers for Precinct 2 Commissioner's Court. We heard from Paula Elizondo, the incumbent earlier. And the phone lines are open. And Daniela has called in. And Daniela, welcome to The Source. You're on the air. Hi, um, my question is, if elected, what would be your first priority? All right, thank you for that question, Daniela. And so it is now uh, get the Rodriguez's uh, opportunity to go first. Well, like I talked about, um, one of the most important things to do is to really focus on meeting people's basic needs. We have a tendency in government to uh, focus on projects, and projects are good, and projects can have some good outcomes, but we need to take a step back and really prioritize um, how we spend our taxpayer dollars. There isn't really a comprehensive plan, and so we we'll take a step back and create a comprehensive plan that really uh, really outlines what our priorities are. On day one, um, what I plan to do is open up a community uh a community uh, office. Precinct 2 has never had a community office, and I will also set a schedule for community town halls. We've never once had a town hall in our com in Precinct 2 um, in, in many, many years, as long as I can remember. I'm a native of Precinct 2. Uh, because, again, it's about that changing that mindset that we are representative of the people, that it's up to the people to, to tell us what it is that is most important to them, and we and 
Precinct 2 and all of Bear County really being as large as it, as it is, um, the needs of each neighborhood is, uh, can vary. In the near west side, for example, you know, the needs are really basic infrastructure and economic development. In areas out by 1604 and Bandera, transportation is one of the most significant problems. So it's really outlining that, but s- establishing a community uh, precinct office to make ourselves accessible to people to, so that you know that we're here to serve you. At the end of the day, that's what we're there to do. It, I would most likely obviously have to have a interim office um, in the short term as we plan for a, a longer term solution to that and creating our schedule to get out into the community and talking to the people. All right. And now we follow up with Mario Bravo, the other candidate. So my number one priority is improving the health of the community. Um, just look at diabetes, for example. We have the highest rate of diabetes in the state. And we are so late to diagnose patients and give them care that we have the highest rate in the nation of people who have to have amputations because of their diabetes. And that's entirely preventable. And I know the commissioner said he's done some projects, and I'm glad he, he recognizes that, uh, that this is an issue. But my focus is going to be to continue on providing good health care for people who get sick, but also we need to go more into the neighborhoods more and help help lift people up, help them, help them have more opportunities to meet their basic needs so they can be healthy so they don't end up in the hospitals. Um, you know, I want people to know I'm serious about this. Uh, typically, when somebody runs for office, they might ask uh, somebody from a powerful political family to be their campaign treasurer and uh, to in order to convey to the community that they have strong political backing. Instead, I went and I asked a professor from UT Health San Antonio who focuses on community health to be my, my t- treasurer. And she's advising me, along with many other doctors from throughout the community, including the former state epidemiologist. They're all advising me on these issues. I've gone before the Bear County Medical Society and and, and taken my, my plan to make our community healthier. They have vetted my plan and gave me feedback. And so I'm going to continue to work on that. It's, it's really important that we, that we get our health under control here in the community. All right. And our next question I'm going to ask you, and you'll go first, Mario Bravo. Uh, talk about the decision-making process that you went through when you decided to run for office. Was there one particular thing that really just sold you on it and triggered you? And you said, I am going to make the jump and I'm going to run. You know, I've always been interested in running for office and serving the community. I never knew for sure when would be the right time. Um, but I did have an experience when I was out campaigning for Councilwoman Anna Sandoval, and I was talking to voters, knocking on doors, and somebody told me uh, about how they used to work at, uh, at City Hall, and one day they got a phone call, and the commissioner called, and somebody had possibly been drunk driving. They hit a, a brick mailbox um, on the commissioner's property and knocked it over, and the commissioner called, and he demanded that somebody from City Hall come over there and fix his mailbox because I guess he had different elected officials who who answered to him over there. And so this staff person and another, they both had to go over to Commissioner Elisondo's house, and they told me that they were they were picking up the bricks and somebody was insisting that they fix the mailbox, and the other person said, this isn't our job. You know, this we don't, uh, we don't work for the commissioner. And by the way, this is prop- private property, and so this we shouldn't be doing this. And the other person said, you don't understand. This is Commissioner Elisondo. We need to fix this mailbox now. And... At that moment, I just told myself, you know, the commissioner's forgotten who serves who. And we, we, I felt like we needed, needed better representation in, at, at the commissioner's court. And, uh, I started looking for candidates at the time. I didn't think it had to be me. I looked around and I didn't find somebody at the time. And so I decided that I was going to stand up and and I was going to offer myself to serve. All right. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about that story. So that's an accusation against commissioner Paula Lozano. Do you have, and you, it's hearsay, or did you establish that that actually happened? Uh, th- this is a story that was told to me by someone who used to work at City Hall. And you ever did you ask him about it? I did not ask him. So right now it's hearsay? Sure. Okay. All right. So people will keep that in mind. All right. So now let's go to get the Rodriguez with your uh, – tell us your story about what, what prompted you to say, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump in. All right. Um, 
quite honestly, sent, uh, service is really central to who I am. I was born and raised in, in uh, here in San Antonio and Precinct 2 to two parents who were actually have been involved in the community for decades, as long as I can remember. So I, you know, as a child, I was, you know, given speeches at, uh, to, seniors, to seniors at community centers. Um, I was block walking and phone banking and, you know, trying to find leaders that um, I thought would do the best for the community that I lived in. You know, I mentioned that I grew up in the poorest zip code in the community and um, being one of five girls that grew up from elementary school at JT Brockenridge Elementary going on to Tafoya and to Lanier High School, um, I was the only one of the four of us that graduated before becoming a mom or succumbing to some other, um, you know, tragedy. Uh, one of them is no longer with us. She was a victim of domestic violence. One of them turned to drugs. Um, the other two, I believe, you know, eventually went on to uh, obtain their, their uh, GED, but again, not without uh, facing some significant challenges. I mentioned that I went to go serve at, uh, in the Marine Corps for 20 years. And um, upon my return uh, as the county veteran service officer, I saw many of the, I saw my community and many of the areas in Precinct 2 exactly the same way as I found them as they were when I left. Um, and that was really disappointing to me. Um, and so that that obviously had a very profound impact because we still have the highest rates of poverty in some areas um, after decades of the same leadership. Um, we still have the highest rates of domestic violence, highest rates of crime, those types of things. So being someone who was born and raised here, this is uh, very personal to me. And um, you know, again, be, being someone who has served my country, service is very central to who I am. I decided that it was time for new leadership and a different mindset. Okay, another caller question, and this is from Rosanna. Rosanna, welcome to The Source. Uh, you're on the air, and your question will first be going to Akita Rodriguez, can, Democratic candidate for Bear County Precinct 2. Hi, um, thank you for taking my call. I, I think um, the candidates touched on this a little bit, and Ms. Rodriguez uh, especially, about her background. My question was, what about your background and history gives you special insight or knowledge into the problems of the community? Um, any other detail or maybe um, plans with that insight or special knowledge um, that you want to take to the community? All right, thank you, Rosanna, for that question. And so, Ms. Rodriguez. So, yeah, and I can expand a little bit. You know, I, like I said, I'm born and raised here, uh, very familiar, very um, deep-rooted in the community, um, and because of my, my parents' work as well. Um, but some of the things that I really think that we can do, and I have experience working within county government. As a matter of fact, before my department was moved to directly uh, below the commissioner's court, I was, uh, my uh, department belonged to the Department of Community Resources. And that particular department provides services that are meant to address some of the things that I've talked about. What I think that we can do better is to form stronger partnerships with the city, um, to, to create better coalitions with our state legislators. I mean, this is a really important time. Um, given all the stuff that's been going on at the state legislature, you know, the, the lack of funding for education, all of those things are barriers to achieving success. And so I want us to focus on on these on these areas you know infrastructure housing transportation those types of things are barriers to for people to achieve prosperity and the insight that i have from having grown up in the community still knowing people who live in the community and more importantly the motivation and the ability to build coalitions and to be innovative and to have um the will and desire to go out into the com to the different communities and different neighborhoods and talk to those people to make sure that we are that we are um, approaching this from a from a from a good uh, perspective, but also taking the talent that we have in county government, we have county staff that are very well versed in this. Let's give them more resources. Let's let's allow them to really maximize their potential and their skill sets. Give them enough resources so that we can attack these problems. All right, and now Mario Bravo. So I, I used to serve on the Alamo Area Council of Government's Air Improvement Resources Advisory Committee. I served as a, a volunteer on that committee uh, up until Governor Greg Abbott uh, v line item vetoed all of our air quality funding for the region. Um, and uh, But before that committee was dissolved after the, the veto, uh, I learned that we didn't have a, an air quality monitor far enough over on the west side of San Antonio to know what our air quality is like. And we're, n we're not meeting federal minimum air quality standards. And so at that time, what I did is I wrote every city council member on the west side. I wrote the mayor. I went to Citizens to be Heard. And I advocated to get 
a next an air quality monitor at, added because we had had all of them turned off. CPS Energy stepped up. They decided to, to to turn them back on, but we needed to add an extra one, and we have. And uh, we just have preliminary data, but we know that the air quality is not good on the west side from that preliminary data. Uh, I've also worked with San Anto Cultural Arts, which is in zip code 78207, the poorest zip code in the county, um, which is in the district that precinct 2 that I'm running in right now. And uh, I, I got a um, – I was – I won a grant, a $10,000 grant, in order to help them put on a summer school. And this was really important because this summer school is where kids would learn about art, and then I would go and teach them about environmental issues, and then they could make create art based on what they learned from my environmental messages that I taught them. But it was important not just because of that, but it was important because – most of these kids in 78207 during the summer, they don't have a place to go. Their parents can't afford child care. And so they'd be out running around on the streets. They might not have meals on some of those days during the day. And that, but they, San Anto Cultural Arts gave them a place to go, and I was able to learn a lot of the issues that that community is facing right there. In addition to that, I've worked, I went and met with many other organizations because I was contacted by a team of social scientists from across the country, and they asked me if they could – they said they wanted to study what moves Latinos – towards uh, engagement on environmental issues here locally. And, uh, and so we put together, uh, I, I met with a bunch of leaders of the Latino community and I asked them what the issues they were facing and they told me that health is a big issue and uh, that they're not getting support from the county. Okay, uh, so I'm going to remind our listeners that this is The Source on Texas Public Radio, and we're having an issues forum for the candidates running for the Democratic nomination for uh, Bear County Precinct 2. Earlier, we heard in a pre-recorded interview with Paul Elizondo, the incumbent. He's held that office for over 30 years, and now we have a live opportunity with the two candidates who are challenging him, Mario Bravo and Quita Rodriguez. There's also uh, two Republicans who are running for that nomination, and uh, they, they, the winner of this nomination will face the Republican nominee as well. And um, so let me ask you, Mario Bravo, since it's your turn for an answer now on another question, um, what about Paula Lozando's experience? He's been there for 30 years, and uh, do you think that his experience doesn't matter uh, to, to voters? How do you counter his, his level of experience? Absolutely, experience matters. I think that... Um you know, it's important to have experience. When you have experience, you, you know, you can get things done faster and you can be more knowledgeable about the process. There's no question about that. Um, however, once you've been there too long and when you're in an environment in which there are no campaign contribution limits, which I am advocating for, uh, I'm also advocating for term limits, but when you've been there too long, this, he's been there for nine terms, he's asking for a tenth. Your city council members can only serve four terms. And your city council member can't take more than a $500 campaign contribution. Your commissioners can take unlimited. If you've been there too long in a situation where you, you can take unlimited campaign contributions, you begin to form a closer relationship with the donors than you, and lose touch with the community. And I think that's what we've started to see now that he's been there for 34 years. Okay. And now get the Rodriguez. Um, you know, I agree with Mario. You know, experience does matter. Um, but there's a difference between, you know, having experience, yes, you've served there for a long time, and I've said it throughout the campaign. I sincerely appreciate Commissioner Elizondo's service to our community. You know, anybody that goes into public service, you know, we, we're, we're appreciative of that, and I, I can definitely recognize that. Um, but I think that you know, once you have become disconnected from the community, and that's what we're hearing out as we're out, I mean, like I said, knocking door to door and talking to neighborhood associations, is that they don't see the commissioner. Nobody, nobody knows like what he what he does other than what you see in the paper. Of course, the big ticket projects like the San Pedro Creek and the Alameda Theater and some of the things that he mentioned. Um, I think that you can have, uh, if you are a good leader, though. To say that he that he's irreplaceable or that you know if if he's no longer in office then all of these projects are going to stop is really pretty, you know quite frankly surprising. If you're a good leader, you develop the people that you lead. You develop the people that are working for you. And I know that we have a lot of great county staff that have been working on these projects that. Um, ha if he's done his job correctly, would be able to, to carry forward. I mean, he can't be there forever. No one can be there forever. Um, so, and there will always be projects. Uh, I know that the commissioner has said that, you know, he wants to be able to come back and, you know, to cut the ribbon at the, at the San Pedro Creek and some of these other projects. And that's fantastic. No one would, er at least I wouldn't deny him that. You know, I would, I'd, I'd not want the type of person to take credit where, you know, for something that I didn't do. 
I give credit where credit is due. I'd welcome him to come back and to cut the ribbon and to do, you know, to take the credit and to really um, enjoy the success of whatever it is that he's done. But when you were falling asleep at commissioner's court, when you're missing half of the uh, half of the roll calls when you're expected to be there, that says something. I mean, in, even a family member, if there's a family member that I think just really isn't no longer up to the task, then it's my job to tell them, hey, love what you've done, but it's time. Okay, here's a question from Twitter, and this is from Pete. What would you do to reduce the tax burden? And so, Keta Rodriguez, uh, can you answer that? So, yeah, I know that that is such a significant issue for so many people. Um, I think that we really need to take a look at, at, at creative ways of doing that. Um, I've heard the commissioner say that, you know, the, the county has lowered the tax rate. Well, yes, technically that's true. However, your tax rate, your tax bill keeps going up every year, and it's because of appraisals. The appraisals um, are going continue to rise um, on property values, and so that's what's making our tax our tax bill increase. Um, I recently listened to uh, our chief appraiser Michael Amesquita talk about the problems with the tax appraisals as they apl are applied to commercial uh, properties and residential properties. There's such a huge disparity. Um, the lack of uh, not not being able to disclose uh, uh, purchase prices is a problem, and I'm not saying that I'm you know uh, uh, completely want to dismantle that, but it's something that we definitely need to look at because what's happening is some of these bigger companies are being able to fight the appraisals. They're dragging these things, you know, dragging these things out, and at the end of the day, the burden, the tax burden, is really uh, shifting to the residential taxpayer because that person doesn't have the time or the money or the resources to go and fight those rising property tax values. Another thing that I think we can do is to teach people how to go and how to go and um, go before the board to. Uh, to fight against the appraisal itself. That's something we need to educate our public, again, with active and engaged leadership, going out to the public and, tell, and holding classes, letting them know that you actually can, um, you can, I um, forgot, uh, Challenge, challenge yes, I'm sorry, thank you. You can challenge the appraisal itself. And so by doing that, um, then you have a better shot at keeping your, your, val your appraised value lower, which will lower your tax rate, your tax uh, burden. Okay, and now Mario Bravo, your answer to the question from Pete on Twitter, what would you do to reduce the tax burden? Well, yeah, definitely the first thing you need to do is stop m increasing the tax burden, um, which is what's happening. You know, if you look at what's being paid this year over the last year, um, total taxes being paid have gone up by $19 million in the county. Now, $10 million of that is due to new development, but $9 million of it is not. Um, that, and that's because of the, the appraisal values that have gone up so much. So they are taking in more money. Um, so there are multiple ways. One, improving the health of the community to, through preventative health care. That's going to reduce the tax burden at the county hospital, which we all pay for. Um, another one is not, put, not keeping poor people in jail who don't need to be there. You know, we pay $59 a day to keep somebody in jail. And if somebody's charged with a crime, they're presumed innocent until found guilty. Now, if somebody's a threat to society, sure, let's, let's remove them from society and keep them in there. But some people, you know, there's a risk assessment tool that's being used in some counties. And what they look at is, is this person a flight risk? Is this person a violent offender? Is this person likely to commit another crime? And if they rate low on all three, then you let them out and you say, all right, we're going to send you a letter and we'll let you know when you need to come for to trial. Because we have people who can't afford bail and they're kept in there for long periods of time. You could be in there for eight months easily or longer. If you're in there for eight months at $59 a day because you couldn't afford a $1,000 bail, you know, the county taxpayers pay $14,000 to keep you in jail because you couldn't afford a thousand to get out. And the thing is that keeping that person in jail, that person who, who, who is living paycheck to paycheck, that's contributing to generational poverty because while they're in jail, they don't show up for work and so they lose their job. They don't pay rent, so they get evicted. If they don't have a uh, family who can go pick up their possessions when they get evicted, they lose all of their possessions. If they were in their car driving on the road, their car is going to be towed. There's going to be towage storage fees for $100 a day times eight months. You know, they owe $24,000 on their car that might only be worth $5,000. They lost their car. Who's supporting their kids while they're in there? And so now there are kids who don't have a, a parent supervisor there in their home. And so it's contributing to, genera contributing to generational poverty, and it's wasting taxpayer dollars. All right. So now let's go to a caller. And the caller question is from uh, Richard M. Richard M., welcome to The Source. Uh, you're on the air, and your question first goes to Mario Bravo. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, last year, statistics released by the U.S. Census Bureau indicated that poverty had actually increased 
uh, in our area in Bear County, and now uh, one in five residents here lives at or below the poverty line. What would each of you do to address multi generational poverty in San Antonio? All right, thank you for that question. And so, uh, Mario Bravo. Well, I just uh, answered it um, partially on um, on that that uh, reform as far as using the risk assessment tool. And there's actually there's a um, there's a district judge in Bear in Noises County. Um, down in Corpus Christi, who's been using this tool for less than a year and has taken the jail inmate population from 101% capacity to 85% capacity in less than a year. She saved the community hundreds of thousands of dollars. We could save millions here with our larger jail, but we'd also not be contributing to generational poverty, and we need to stop that. Um, there's so many programs that we can do as well. You know, um, access to nutritious food. We need to be more supportive of programs that are helping serve as distribution sites for the food bank, um, helping organizations that are on the ground, organizations like the Madonna Center, like West End Hope in Action, like uh, the House of Neighborly Services, who, who operate in zip codes like 78207, and help senior citizens sign up for services that they didn't know, might, different resources that they weren't aware were available to them, helping people sign up for health care who are who are avail- who are eligible to for- to sign up for the Affordable Care Act, um, making sure that you provide more public transportation so that people can get to other jobs and they're not limited to jobs that are just in their neighborhood. There's so much that we can do that we that we could do more on right now. Okay, and get the Rodriguez. What would you do to try to end the cycle of multi generational poverty in the district and in Bear County as a whole? You know, in in any company. Um, when the company is not producing profit, what they do is they take a step back and take a look, try to identify the root causes of those problems. And then they focus, um, they focus intensely on, on fixing that problem and then tweak it as, as, as they go. I see, I see this as kind of the same thing. One, we don't really talk about it that much. We don't talk about poverty. And, and uh, the caller's uh, statistics is right. Poverty is go- has gone down nationally, but in San Antonio, it has gone up. And I think part of it is the mindset. And I've, I think I've heard the commissioner say there's always going to be p- p- poor people. We're always going to have in the ha- we're going to have the have and the have nots. That's not really an acceptable way to do it. Other cities in the in the country have actually reduced poverty by using innovative ideas. Um, what my first grade teacher, Shelly Potter, she is the president of the um, San Antonio Alliance, has talked about a, um, a pilot program in certain cities, including Austin, called Community Schools. The Community Schools basically makes the school in a very distressed community as kind of the hub for services. And through that particular uh, community school, you know, all of the services are accessible to the people that need them the most. And with, with that, focusing on education and training programs that really allow people to uh, acquire the skills to uh, be able to get better jobs and get themselves out of poverty. Concentrated poverty, significant problem. I think we need to move away from some of these areas where we have concentrated poverty and move and try to put people into mixed income housing. That has that has had a very successful impact in many uh, cities across the country. Um, but again, it's going back and. and First, identifying that this is, in fact, a problem, and it's not just a problem for the impoverished, impoverished community. It impacts everyone. We can't have – we, we don't have a qualified workforce because we have people that don't have the education and skills um, necessary All right. to meet the demand. Back to the phones, and this is Bonnie. And, Bonnie, uh, you're on the air, and your question will be going to uh, Ketha Rodriguez. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I wanted to ask about, in general – Countywide, the distribution of acute care hospitals and full service hospitals. There's areas of the city where there's, you know, uh, if you need a hospital after the bus is shut down, you're in trouble if you don't have a car. There's areas where hospitals are being built, like new hospitals are opening on top of each other. It seems. Uh, very uneven distribution of services. Okay, Bonnie, thank you for that question. And get the Rodriguez. 
Thank you. Thank you for that question, Bonnie. Um, I That's definitely an issue. Again, we have historically underserved communities in the county, and in these historically underserved communities have been like this for decades. And it goes right back to what I've been talking about, is that taking a, taking a comprehensive approach. The county created a health collaborative, which has done some phenomenal work in identifying um, gaps in services and trying to find solutions, bringing together community partners to address those issues um, in gaps in services. But, you know, we definitely can do more. We have to go back and take a look at what you just said. You just said that in some areas, if there's no bus line that's going there, um, then that or when the bus shuts down, that you cannot get to the you cannot get to a hospital if you, you if you have an emergency, whereas in other parts of the city and the county, we have um, uh, we have a- uh, adequate access to health care. Um, so again, going back to the root causes of the problems, one, a lack of a, tra- a transportation system that's available to make things accessible, but two, a comprehensive plan that looks at the most underserved communities and, so, and tries to find the solutions to those particular problems. In this case, maybe a community-based, out, uh, community-based healthcare uh, clinic. The Department of Veterans Affairs has something similar to that, whereas Audie Murphy Hospital is on uh, over in the medical center area but then there are community-based outpatient clinics. And I know that the county has done some stuff to partner with other agencies, but we can do more. If there's still a gap in services, then that's where we need to focus our efforts, and it goes right back to reprioritizing what we are doing and how we are spending our taxpayer dollars so that we're doing the most with what we have. All right, and now Mario Bravo, the access to hospitals, particularly for people who depend upon public transportation. So that's a great point that Bonnie brings up. It's absolutely a problem. And, um, you know, we have a structural incentive problem with between Metro Health and the county health services. So Metro Health is in charge of of protecting and improving our public health, right? And they are part of the city. Now, so the city funds them a lot. They also get other grants. But if if Metro Health doesn't do a good job for whatever reason, if they're underfunded or mismanaged, then it doesn't affect the city in that it doesn't affect the city's budget when people get sick. When people get sick in our community, they go to the county hospital and the county taxpayers pay for it. So in, the city is not penalized for not doing a good job, and the county is not really investing in Metro Health much. They are, they're, currently, they're investing l- less than one half of 1% of Metro Health's budget comes from the county currently. And they, so what we need to do is we need to focus more on keeping people, getting people healthier, investing in public health and preventative health care, and uh, helping people meet their basic needs so that they can be healthier so they don't have to go to the hospital as often. At the same time, we do have to make sure that people have access to clinics. If people don't... and these. Having access to a doctor only represents a very small part of whether somebody's going to be healthy or not over their lifetime. A big part of it is do you have access to transportation? Do you have access to nutritious food? Uh, do you have access to a good education, to a job that pays a living wage? If you don't have access to transportation, you can't go to refill your prescription. If you're not making a living wage, maybe um, maybe you can pay for your copay to get your prescription, but your car breaks down the next month, and then you have to choose between fixing your car or doing or getting your, renewing your prescription and uh, you know you got to get to work so you fix your car next thing you know you don't renew your prescription and you end up in the emergency room and we need to be focused on preventative care and keeping people out of the emergency room but we do need to have more access to uh, community clinics as well. So recently on The Source we had a very lively program about what to do about Bandera Road between Loop 410 and 1604. Uh, TxDOT is of the mind to build a uh, elevated high, uh, fast link between uh, the two and uh, Leon Valley and people who live in that area say we'd rather have a, a full service smart street boulevard and so that runs through your district, the one that you're trying to represent. So, uh, Mario Bravo, what do you think, uh, what would you be looking at, and how would you try to uh, 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 serve the needs of all your constituents in that area? Uh, well, we need to be working on solutions right now. My understanding is that Commissioner Elizondo has put a stop to anything moving forward at the moment, and uh, we need to be, you know, we need to be focused on multimodal transportation, absolutely. Um, and I would support that without a doubt. Okay, and uh, get the Rodriguez? I really think that this comes right back to the same point that I keep making, and that's leadership. 
leadership and engagement with the community. I don't think that we do enough in Bear County to really help our small business owners. I think that we need to do everything that's possible. And if the community is saying this is what they want, as their representative, it is our obligation to advocate on their behalf. I see myself as an advocate for the people that I serve, uh, not the other way around. So it is not Completely. Well, yes, at the ultimately, it's my vote on the commissioner's court on what we do. But at the end of the day, I am supposed to be a representative of the community. I can completely understand why the community would not want what TxDOT is proposing. Um, obviously, it's going to hurt some of the business owners in that area, and it's not the most attractive um, solution either. So I would side on the on I would side with the residents and what it is that they want and those business owners because the last thing we want to do is hurt a small business that's located in that um, on on Bandera. Um, by by basically um, just uh, ignoring what it is that they're asking for. It's our job to advocate on their behalf. Okay, and I've got a, a short question. I don't have time for about a minute response, but let me ask you about this. And get the you're going to go first, get the Rodriguez. And so, Bear County commissioners recently approved three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in matching contribution to the San Antonio Symphony after there were some problems about uh, the symphony's operations. Uh, do you support that vote? Do you think that that is an uh, adequate use for uh, that much money? I I feel like a I feel like a broken record. I really feel that it, it, it really goes back down to priorities. Of course, I support the arts. I think that it's really important for us to have, um, you know, that we have that we need to support, you know, the, our, our arts. And the symphony is a great um, is a great uh, instrument of that. However, if I have to prioritize um, taxpayer dollars, they're going to go to meeting our most basic needs. We don't have a modern transportation system, and we need that now. We have communities that have zero economic development where properties have remained stagnant or have been in decline. That needs to be addressed now. We have a, a inadequate education system that needs to be addressed now. We have crumbling infrastructure in some of our communities that needs to be addressed now. So my priority would be to focus taxpayer dollars these are that's money that is collected by the county from each of our residents um those would be prioritized right. toward meeting basic uh, needs and, and over. so just just so it sounds like you would be a no vote on that yes it would i would be you would have been a no yes. vote okay now mario bravo how would you have voted on the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to help keep the san antonio symphony going I, I absolutely support the arts. I actually just had a campaign event for people in the arts community, and uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollars. You have to understand the commissioner's budget, the commissioner's court budget is one point seven six billion with a B dollars. So three hundred fifty thousand dollars. That was a drop in the bucket right there. Um, and it's, I think it's especially important if uh, there's a situation where you need some, you know, last minute rescue financing. Um, but I also think you need to focus on the basics first. And there is so much fat that can be cut from the commissioner's court budget right now. We don't have a transparent competitive bidding process right now. I talk to, I talk to business, business owners all the time who say they don't, they don't bid on any of, the, any of the contracts from the county because they know they don't have a shot at them. There's a, a select group of large donors okay. who get sweetheart deals. And because of that, we're not spending our money, our taxpayer dollars efficiently. There's lots of extra money that could and be so you, used you'd be, applied you to, to meet the basics of our community. So you would have been a yes vote. I would on. be a yes vote, but I would also make sure that I find okay. money to meet the basics in our community, right. okay. the essentials, because so, we can't um, neglect that. Now we've got to wrap up with closing comments. And so each of you all get a minute to kind of close the sale here and make your pitch to listeners about why they should vote for you in the Democratic primary for Bear County Precinct 2. And Mario Bravo, you go up first. Great. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a lifelong, proud, progressive Democrat, and I'm the only c candidate in this race on record who's called for campaign contribution limits and called for term limits. I'm the only candidate on record who's been campaigning to protect our air and water quality and reduce our impact on climate change. I'm the only candidate in this race who's run on protecting the basic rights of undocumented immigrants. I'm the only candidate in this race who's on record saying that we need to end our contracts with for-profit private prisons. We should not be doing business with organizations that are interested in putting more people in prison and keeping them in there longer. 
Now, you don't have to live in this district, in Bear County Precinct 2, to support me. Um, if you want me to bring these values to our commissioner's court, you can support me by going to my Facebook page and following me and sharing my posts. Help me get my message out. Go to my website, make a contribution, uh, sign up to volunteer. And if you do live in, in Precinct 2, I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Get the Rodriguez, you get to close out uh, with your last-minute pitch. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. You know, I want to I want to focus on on one thing, and that is in, engaged leadership. That is what I bring. I've got 25 years of leadership experience. And what we are hearing, like I mentioned earlier, is that that is what we are. That is what is lacking. Engaged leadership, representative leadership, remembering who we are and why we are here. Um, I want to make very clear that, you know, the question about the arts Again, it's about it's about prioritizing things. Three hundred and fifty there, seven hundred and fifty thousand there on a on a project at San Pedro on an art piece at San Pedro Creek. That's not even going to someone who is from the area. It's about meeting people's basic needs and bringing the leadership and the skills and the collaborative ability to uh, build coalitions that best encompass our values. County government is extremely important to our everyday lives, and I really would like the listeners to, to consider the type of person that you want representing you. All right, I, and uh, that wraps up our time for that. And get the Rodriguez, Mario Bravo, two challengers, uh, Paul Elizondo defending the seat that he's occupied for 30 years, over 30 years, Bear County, Precinct 2, and this is the Democratic primary that we're talking about. Early voting begins on February 20th, Election Day, March 6th, and then we have the general election election on November the 6th. This is The Source on Texas Public Radio. This has been The Source on Texas Public Radio. The Source is produced by Kim Johnson, Jan Ross Piedad, and David Martin Davies. Production assistance is provided by me, Ruben Garcia. Support for The Source comes from the contributors to the Community Engagement Fund, including the Gladys and Ralph Lazarus Foundation. Tomorrow at noon on The Source, never before has economic competitiveness been more important for a city. The companies that can provide good paying jobs and a strong tax base are picking and choosing where to go based upon where they can find the best workers and provide them the highest quality of life. How does San Antonio stack up? The SA 2020 report card takes a hard look. That's on The Source tomorrow at noon on Texas Public Radio.